All right, well, it's great to be here. I've really enjoyed attending Baikai over the years, so it's an honor to come speak. Today I'm going to be talking about, uh, well, Firefox, and really the, the talk's sort of broken into three parts. The first is understanding Mozilla. Mozilla's a reasonably strange organization and kind of hard to understand, so we'll talk a little bit about what they stand for and how they operate. And secondly, I'm going to speak sort of generically about different types of design philosophies uh, to sort of build a context to understand how Mozilla fits into that. And then I'll give some specifics about designing Firefox 3 and Firefox 4, and maybe talk a little bit about Firefox 5, uh, particularly in the questions. So getting started, understanding Mozilla. So Mozilla's mission is to protect the free and open web. That's their purpose and the, way that they, the, like the reason they exist. And Firefox is a tool for them to achieve that. And I think you can really understand a lot about an organization by looking at their artwork. And uh, here's some sort of classic Mozilla artwork. This is by Shepard Ferry, um, the same artist who created the Obama Hope portrait. And like, this is artwork for a revolution. I mean, there's obviously you shouldn't draw like, a direct analogy to history. But clearly, like, <laughs> Mozilla has some like, revolutionary undertones here. And um, this isn't just true of Mozilla, but really computing as a whole. I mean, there's this great book by uh, John Markoff, uh, What the Dormouse Said, where he talks about how 60s counterculture, you know, particularly in this area, like you know, very much this area with being a park, uh, really shaped the personal computing industry. And you know, he writes, computing went from being dismissed as a tool for bureaucratic control to truly really being embraced as a symbol of individual expression and liberation. So you know, there's this very sort of counterculture aspect to personal computing. And this was captured in a lot of the, the you know, things that were created around that time, like you know, Apple's 1984 advertisement. You know, we see that now, and it seems kind of strange and obscure. But if you think about sort of their mindset at the time, you know, it was about running in and throwing that hammer and destroying that screen, uh, you know, taking down that centralized power. And Stuart Brand writes, you know, the counterculture's scorn for centralized authority provided the philosophical foundations, not only of the leaderless internet, but also the entire personal computing revolution. So it's really not just about computing, but also the network. And of course, you know, today we both have you know, personal computers, and we have the free and open web. And uh, you know, especially in terms of the free and open web, we can really thank a lot of the people in Netscape and the work that they did. We're at the beginning of an industry, and, and who knows where that industry is going to go. This could all turn into television again. It could be controlled by a small number of, 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 uh, of companies who, who decide what we see and hear. And there's a lot of precedent for that. So that was uh, Jamie Zawinski, one of the uh, programmers at Netscape and then later Mozilla, who was really instrumental in getting uh, Mozilla open sourced and creating the movement. And you know, what was on his mind was it could all turn into television again. You know, he was fighting for the very fabric of what the web was. And we're so used to the web, it's hard for us to even imagine what that would be like. Um, but you know, there's this great visualization that was posted to Reddit. Um, you know, sort of capturing the notion of what if we didn't have net neutrality? And you know, it's not that hard to imagine where it's you know, basically mega corporations doing billion dollar deals to each other um, you know, and you know, sort of monetizing everything and you know, selecting which websites you want to have access to. And it's a system based on you know, exclusivity, lockdown, and then using those two for monetization. And we've seen the web kind of go towards this at various times. Like how many people remember you know, IE4 and the channel bar? So, Boris remembers that. No one else? All right. <laughs> All right. I'm sure many of you remember IE4. Um, and they basically, uh, you know, they took the desktop and they, they gave it to the major networks and they said, well, this isn't, you know, broadcast television enough. Um, you know, we can make a lot of money by making this, you know, locked down and exclusive and monetized. And, you know, that makes sense from the perspective of protecting shareholder value. But it's not really the personal freedom and individual expression that the web is all about. I mean, this basically can be cast directly into that same model of centralized authority. But of course, you know, that was 1997. That was this ancient era in the browser wars. So like, clearly that's over, right? You know, the web's fine. Everything's going great. Well, <laughs> so uh, just a couple years ago, so I'm in Las Vegas, and I'm in a cab, and I'm talking to the taxi driver. And he says, what do you do? I said, well, I work on Firefox. And he says, oh, yeah, you know, I was going to switch to that, but I decided not to. And I said, well, why, why did you decide not to? Why, why, what held you back? He's like, well, I really like YouTube, right? And you know, of course, we all laugh at that. Well, you can get YouTube on any site. But that's really, you know, his mental model was one of cable packages, one of Howard Stern signing with one satellite provider or a different satellite provider, you know, one of bookstores, content being sort of segregated into the various silos. And this is a model that's still very, very popular today. I mean, the Kindle is a fabulous device, but it's based on exclusivity, lockdown, monetization. And you know, if you want to switch to a different uh, type of device, well, hopefully Amazon makes it. Or if you um, do decide to finally switch, it's time to rebuy all of your books again. And maybe you can't even read certain books, because they're only on the Kindle. 
So really what the web stands for and the freedom of the web is you know, not having that sort of silo model. And we're seeing it emerge you know, even in browsers. So here's, you know, hi Glenn, um, sorry, Chrome design team's in the back. Uh, here's the, uh, the Chrome App Store. And it's, it's a fabulous app store. There's a lot of really great stuff in there, but we also see you know, exclusively for Google, Google Chrome users where they're starting to you know, do, focus on these aspects of exclusivity, lockdown, and monetization. And this is a great model for them in terms of building shareholder value and making billions of dollars, but it's really not the web. So you know, back from the channel bar to the present, you know, it's very much the fight still in play, where Mozilla exists to try to protect this free and open web. So you know, I keep saying free, and I keep saying monetization. And of course, you know, we're not communists, uh, despite the artwork that we create. Um, <laughs> like, we're, we're not trying to create a model where no one can make money. It's, in, in fact, it's really the opposite of that. Uh, if anything, we're libertarians. So, I mean, the web is the freest market that humanity has ever seen. And you can tell how free a market is by how fast things happen. So, for instance, let's say you're a college student, and then, bam, $65, million, $65 billion company, and the time spanning that is seven years. I mean, that's incredible. And that's the kind of thing that can't happen uh, in a different model. So when we say free and open, we mean free in the free market sense, you know, this kind of freedom. Uh, the market where you can take any idea, you can really live the American dream and create a company and not have to deal with other huge companies that have already locked everything down. So, you know, under centralized control, this type of innovation really is, you know, it's hindered and competition is hindered. So, you know, under this model, you know, the time is sort of never to infinity when you're able to launch your company. So why do people contribute to Mozilla? What's, what's sort of the, the advantage for them? Because, um, I mean, many of them are working for free. Uh, they're contributing their time. And there's really a few aspects to this. I mean, the first is they tend to be really passionate. Um, it's really something they care about. So, I mean, this is sort of an altruistic objective. They're, they're caring about this cause. But it's also, um, you know, there's an aspect of passion which is like, you know, glory, right? Like, I remember a history professor describing that every human action was taken for you know, either gold, glory, or God. Well, we don't have a lot of religion you know, baked into the valley, but we do have a lot of gold. But that's not to say that glory isn't also something that motivates human activity. They're sort of doing it because of the scale of it, because they care. So another thing that's not really altruistic but motivates people is access. So let's say you're working on um, you know, a JavaScript engine and how to optimize it. It's very much in your interest to be able to speak with the guy who created JavaScript as you try to share ideas and work together. So uh, we have you know, many PhD computer science students you know, helping us, you know, not just to help us, but also to you know, help them further their research and give them access to, the, you know, to channels they otherwise wouldn't have. Then sort of the third aspect is identity. The people really, you know, working on Firefox is more than just something they do. It becomes sort of part of their personal identity. And you know, this is, of course, a temporary tattoo, but there's this aspect of people really you know, sort of passionately caring about this cause. And another interesting thing is, you know, contributors, they span the entire organization. It's, it's not just engineering, it's not just code. So for instance, um, you know, marketing is a great example where we see Firefox 1.0, this was an uh, ad in the New York Times, and um, you know, the, the logo is made out of the names of people who donated to get that ad in place. So it's interesting both in terms of the message, but also in the fact that we didn't really know this was happening, like it just sort of self-organized itself and got put into the New York Times. Uh, an ad executive helped out with, with getting the ad in at the very end for, um, you know, just for free because he cared. Um, sometimes the marketing's not quite as conventional as a normal newspaper ad. Uh, here's a bunch of students uh, at Oregon State University um, learned how to make a crop circle. You know, it actually were those humans that made it. It's really not that hard. And they documented the whole thing as the other hilarious thing. You know, it's open source crop circles. Um, <laughs> or, uh, you know, projecting Firefox onto the Coliseum. Um, so, you know, it's not code, it's marketing. Um, also legal. So how many people have unlocked their cell phones in the audience? All right, three. So this is now, this is now legal to do in the U.S., which is great. And um, Mozilla filed some documents in favor of this, uh, and it was legal contributors, law school students that were interested in doing this. They, they brought the cause to us, and then Mozilla was a channel for them. So it, it is now legal to unlock your phone. So how, now how many people have unlocked their phone in the audience? If you want to fess up to it? Um, and of course, uh, you know, outside of code and, and marketing and, and legal, we have design. And that's what this talks about. So first I want to talk a little bit about design philosophy, basically understanding how Mozilla fits into the spectrum. So I'd argue there's really two approaches to UX design. So the first one you could call user-centric design, where you know, here you're focusing on user needs and things they want, and if they like A more than B, and they say the customer is always right. 
So you're really intently sort of monitoring and focusing on customers. And then the second sort of other end of the spectrum is sort of the strong designer model, where you know in this model you're, the designer's basically saying, I know what you want more than you do. Like, I don't want to talk to you, I don't want to listen to you, I've got this grand vision of this thing that I want to make. And you know, it's, it's usually not all one or the other, there's usually some kind of you know, spectrum and a design team will land somewhere on that spectrum. So um, to provide some you know, various examples of how we've seen this play out in terms of color, you know, there's of course there's the classic Google post of 41 shades of blue as they're trying to optimize for the perfect shade. Uh, and then under the other model, you have you know, any color you want as long as it's black. You know, the sort of Henry Ford, you know, I don't care about your data. So really, both models have inherent risks built into them. So the risk of the strong designer model is they might be a total idiot. Like, you might just have colossal failure under this model. Um, like, to draw an analogy to Hollywood, you, you, know, you have des uh, directors, and they might direct a fantastic movie if they're in charge, or it might be an awful movie. Or you could focus group the movie a lot, and then you're sort of guaranteed to get you know, just sort of an average movie. Audiences will like it. It's probably not going to spike up to brilliant, but it's, it's more sort of tolerant of risk. So under the strong designer, you could have huge success, huge failure. Um, this is something Don Norman likes to talk about. So that's not to say there isn't risks built into the sort of bland approach. In fact, you know, blandness is one of these. Uh, you know, side effects here include you know, complexity, where everyone wants a particular feature. So you're trying to get all those features in. You're listening to these people, and you realize they want various things. So I mean, Microsoft Office for many years was an example of this, where they would continually sort of you know, focus group and market research and then continue to add that complexity. And then the other problem is blandness. Uh, basically, the problem here is you know, you're going to take everyone's favorite color, then you just average that together to gray, and there you go. You have your statistically best, you know, most optimal solution. So I mean, we did that to color, but you could also focus group a painting, uh, more complicated things. So you ask people you know, what they want, traditional, modern, George Washington, they like trees. Um, and here we are, right? Komar and Melamed did this as a hilarious uh, sort of piece of art as they focus grouped paintings. Um, I'll just drink my water as you enjoy how awful this painting is. So clearly focus groups can destroy art, as they showed. But I mean, that's art. What about science? Like, clearly focus groups can't destroy science. I mean, science is science, right? So, um, you know, great example in the 1950s where people were being asked you know, if they liked the, the weight of their handset. And everyone said, yeah, it's great. You know, no change needed. So, you know, based off of science, you could say, well, you know, things seem to be okay. But the problem here is people actually wanted something that was about half the weight of the handset they were given. And as you notice now, handsets are very light, and in the past they were very heavy. But when you ask them, you know, they just basically lied to you. They didn't realize they were lying, but they thought things were fine. So the challenge is to really correctly build the scientific experiment, you have to actually build both handsets and actually give people a chance to use them. Now, unfortunately, it's, it's hard to do this you know, early in the design process because there's a lot of engineering that goes into building. I mean, this would probably be pretty easy, but you imagine uh, you know, building something people can really try out. So this challenge of you know, not really being able to ask users what they want until they can really try it and sort of contemplate it uh, could you know, be called the innovator's dilemma. And uh, Clayton Christian has this great book about this. He basically chronicles companies that failed because they were listening to their customers. And you know, in many cases, they were listening to their immediate customers, as opposed to a larger market, or their customers just didn't really know what they wanted. I mean, they felt they knew what they wanted, but they were lying. So I mean, it, it talks a lot about memory and hard drives and stuff, but some, some modern examples, you know, a phone without a physical keyboard, uh, all the phone companies were doing market research, and you know, business users write a lot of email, and they do a lot of text messaging. Um, so even after the iPhone launched, Steve Ballmer was saying that he didn't think it would do well in the business market because it didn't have a physical keyboard. All their data was saying that. Or the video game industry. Uh, I mean, every hardcore gamer has to have dual analog sticks. That's how they play Halo. That's how they play their first-person shooters. And then Nintendo shows up with the Wii and just completely blows away all the competitors and has the most popular console. So all of that market research was wrong. You know, or you know, a little close to home, but... Uh, <laughs> If you talk to Firefox users, uh, they don't want tabs on top. Uh, in fact, they really hate it um, <laughs> until they use it for a while. Uh, and then they actually like it better. So, so the challenge here, I mean, open source makes this even harder, right? Because open source is about scratching your own itch. It's, in open source, basically, the users are the creators, right? So how do you do design when you have, like, 3,000 people checking in code? Um, I mean, that's just total chaos, right? Everyone has an opinion. Everyone you know, has something they want to work on. 
Um, we've actually landed some of these things. Um, so uh, this is a big problem for us. And basically, there's three ways that we try to solve this problem. So the first one is really focusing on core principles. So I mean, no one argues over if the application should be crashing, right? And no one argues over if, it's, if you, know, you should use more or less memory, right? Because these things are just obvious. Uh, so what's important is to have aspects of usability that are equally obvious. So you know, focusing on you know, like things like Jacob Nielsen's usability heuristics are a good example. Each one's irrefutable. So if you focus more on those, you know, no one's going to be like, no, we shouldn't support undo in this particular case. Um, you know, and that's just one example. There's many sort of lists of heuristics. So we're trying to really ba like bake this into the tools that we're using. So like in Bugzilla, let's say you're doing a find in Firefox, and it always really annoys you that next and previous are in the wrong order. You know, maybe it makes sense because you hit next more often, so you want it to be closer, but like back and forward are not in that order, and it's just, it's just annoying. So you could have this long argument about you know, if that's your personal opinion, or you could just file a bug and say UX natural mapping and invoke that, that principle, that all of the, what carries with that that co uh, sort of code word for that, so that you have this sort of base vocabulary to which you can have you know, debate over design. So we've added you know, a large range of these various principles, and it's really sort of raised the level of UX debate inside the community. So there's really nothing special about interaction designers, except that they're, generally speaking, pretty well educated. So if you, you know, educated in interaction design. So you can take an open source community, people who are experts in code, teach them the basics you know, principles, and they're going to start having better designs, not just in your product, but in all the other products that they use throughout the day as they file bugs on those. So that's the, the first way. The second way is we give contributors the freedom to explore. Um, so this is sort of a, this was an interesting problem. Basically, everyone wanted to change the interface in one particular way, and some ways were better than others, and it wasn't really clear which initially. You, know, you needed the sort of two phone handsets. So we'd hear the phrase, that would make a good extension. Um, and it's very positive, right? You know, yes, go build that. Uh, what it really means is there's absolutely no way we're putting that in the product, so go away. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but it's so much more positive. And in fact, Firefox's whole extension infrastructure is based around this debate. Like the reason it's so easy to extend Firefox is because we built a good extension infrastructure to start settling those debates and letting people run off and try their things. And that, that, you know, maybe your initial reaction is that's a horrible idea, but it's not always the case. You know, people on the boat are saying, you know, we're off to solve the innovator's dilemma. They're going to do something creative. And then you can you know, see how it works out without having to change the mainline product. And then the third way is you elevate contributors who know what they're doing. So even though it's sort of a mix of a corporation and an open source community, that doesn't mean there's not a hierarchy. There's not sort of a meritocracy where some people clearly know what's going on. So an example of this, like the Firefox icon was actually created uh, by open source contributors. Uh, at the time, it looked like this. It was called Phoenix, um, which, you know, it's, it's not great. Someone probably made that in paint or something. Um, you know, it's sort of okay. <laughs> it's also a trademark infringement. Um, and two contributors showed up, and they said, you know, Phoenix is never going to be a mainstream product if it looks like that. Uh, you're trying to put something on everyone's computer, and this is ridiculous. Um, and you know, everyone sort of agreed. Like, uh, people already knew this. Um, this was um, Stephen uh, Garrity and Daniel Burka. And it turns out they were very good designers, and they worked for a really good design firm called Silver Orange. So we said, you know what? You're right. Congratulations. You own this problem. Um, come back uh, with you know, your proposal. Oh, and it's called Firefox uh, because we're getting sued. So, uh, so they came back with a sketch, and uh, this is what they came up with. And I was like, that's pretty good. So then they posted on forums saying, hey, you know, here's a sketch we had, this idea. Um, does anyone have time to render this? Um, and another designer, John Hicks, uh, very quickly turned around a very you know, nicely rendered version. And that was the creation of the Firefox icon um, you know, in the open source community by elevating the people who knew what they were talking about. So between the two models of sort of strong designer versus very sort of user-centric design and you know, focus grouping, we're definitely more focused on the strong designer model. And part of this is because we have to shield the design team from you know, the rest of the open source community. So we're focused on principles and less focused on testing. It doesn't mean that we don't do testing, but we, we tend to uh, sort of start with principles first. Uh, we're using extensions to explore controversial ideas, and the team's really a mixture of employees and trusted contributors. So moving on to now the specifics on designing Firefox. So I think sort of the first important thing to ask is, we're focused on these principles. Well, which principles, right? So we could title this section, The Stuff We Really Totally Messed Up, um, <laughs> which, you know, I've been really looking forward to presenting. Um, so obviously, you know, there's many lists of heuristics. Um, and each of them is irrefutable. But what's interesting about them is some of them are paired against each other. Uh, you can't win. Like, you have to choose A or B. 
So, you know, an example of this, like discoverability is very important. Users need to be able to find the features they're interested in. The downside is if you really focus on discoverability, you totally mess up minimalism. And these two are in an adversarial relationship with each other. Um, or another example, user control. Firefox really nailed user control. Um, it was you know, one of our selling points, one of our sort of core tenants. Uh, the downside is you can never really have perfect user control without having to talk to them. So you sort of mess up no interruptions. Um, and these two are, again, sort of opposed to each other. And then the third one, you know, consistency. And this is very important, both external consistency with you know, older versions that the user has a mental model of, but also your competitors' products that are on the market. So it makes it very easy for them to transition over. And the downside of consistency is you can't really have anything that's really, truly new. Um, so again, these two are against each other. So in case it's not entirely obvious what I'm talking about, um, here's how these two kind of stack up against each other. Um, where Firefox is about discoverability, user control, and consistency, and Chrome brings in minimalism, no interruptions, and it's new. Um, and then, you know, these are all principles, which ones are better? So talk a little bit about how Firefox uh, sort of fell down on some of these. So we non-sarcastically shipped a product that allowed users to create this. Um, <laughs> and it's actually scrolls. Um, so, uh, I mean, this was like one of the selling points of Firefox was you could extend it, right? And users really loved they could extend it. But we didn't build in mechanisms to like, help them deal with the chaos that then uh, came about. And it wasn't just Firefox extensions. Uh, even the interface itself got kind of crufty over time as people started to layer in new features. Uh, we started calling this little area of the UI the lucky charms, you know, horseshoes and rainbows. And, um, and getting rid of each aspect of it was difficult. Like if you go to these bugs, they're like the 300 comment like, you know, riot bugs as we. Yes, right, we hate RSS. Um, so this was hard for us, trying to say, yes, discoverability and user control is important, but minimalism is key as well. And you, know, you have to strike a good balance there. You have to realize they're in competition. So another aspect, user control versus interruptions. Firefox is all about interrupting you. So we ask you a question on open. Then during Firefox, we ask you a question, hey, new version. Then when you quit, we ask you another question. We're just constantly interrupting you. And as you, you know, try to sort of beat down these interruptions, it's always, well, but user control, right? The, the user needs to be in control of what version they're running. The user needs to be in control of setting a default browser. Um, and of course, there's ways to provide users control that don't focus on direct interruptions. But uh, in many cases, they're, they're not aware of the question to begin with, so it's kind of false user control. So again, it's this debate between which of these two is more important. And then sort of the, the final one, consistency versus being new. And you know, when Firefox was first launching, this was everyone's web browser, right? And right around the, the same time as Firefox 2 coming out, Microsoft introduced IE7, where they made some pretty radical changes. They were shipping Vista at the same time, but they rolled out the Vista-style UI to Windows XP users. So if we look at where controls moved, go ahead and just kill the color here. And if we're just focusing on the core, you know, 12 core controls of you know, the command structure of the browser, things like you know, back, forward, stop, reload, home, location bar, you know, it was really sort of a, an array of where things went off to. And you know, people were able to adapt to it. It didn't take them too long. But if we looked at Firefox 2 at the exact same time frame, where again we have IE6, here we have Firefox 2, kill the color. It's exactly the same. And stop and reload switched position for Netscape consistency, so it was still a consistency argument. But it was very easy for users to transition over. So you know, looking at these two again, IE6 to 7 versus 6 to Firefox 2, it was you know, ironically easier for users to switch out of the Microsoft product line than it was for users to stay inside the Microsoft product line. And during the same time period, and of course usability is only one aspect of making a product a success, but Firefox was really taking off. Like we were moving just tens and tens of millions of users off of IE and towards Firefox. And the theory was, like, it's easier for them to adopt. Uh, we've created an adoption curve where they can move over just seamlessly. They don't have to relearn anything. It feels natural. So the problem with this is we, we kept on the strategy too long. So now we have users on IE8, right? And here's Firefox 3. Now Firefox 3 is designed to pull users off of IE6. And it's particularly complicated because we have like half of the marketplace on IE6 and half of the marketplace on a mixture of IE7 and 8. So which half are we going to target? Um, and here we see everything plays in reverse. Uh, in this case, the, core, the 12 core controls, they have navigation here and then the command structure on that side. And Firefox performs very poorly. And of course, um, 
around the time of IA Chrome was also available. And we see how they do. Now, obviously, they stripped a lot out. But in terms of the core controls, we see there's actually quite a bit of consistency, especially with page and tools having the same command structure. Um, or close to the same. Uh, Glenn just kind of smirked. No, not the same. <laughs> All right. Well, you have something called page, and you have something called tools. So <laughs> it, they're, they're named the same. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So during this time period, uh, we see that IE8 to Chrome um, was basically an easier path for users than IE8 to Firefox 3. Uh, IE8 to Firefox 3 had them sort of you know, relearn in terms of this XP mindset of dealing with a traditional menu bar. So it's not that consistency was wrong. It's just we didn't react. We didn't move fast enough in that case. We should have started pulling people off of IE8 considerably sooner. I mean, Firefox 3 is still shipping today. We released the, the release candidate for Firefox 4 yesterday. Uh, but it's not on yes. Yes? <laughs> Mozilla people are like, yay. Um, it's not on the market yet. It will be on the market you know, very shortly. But we're still at this moment trying to pull people off of IE6 in terms of interface. Um, and that's, you know, they have like 12% market share on IE6 now. So sort of moving on off the stuff we got wrong to the stuff we got right, this is the more fun part of the talk. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is the, the concept of flow. Uh, it's kind of hard to describe. You basically have to describe a situation that other people can remember being in before they really understand what I'm talking about. But let's say you're driving a car. And over time, you don't really think about driving anymore. Like, you're still obeying traffic laws. And you're not you know, driving irresponsibly. But suddenly, you're just thinking about you know, how your day was going. And sort of the car just kind of fades away. And the car kind of becomes an extension of yourself. Uh, in the same way that you don't really think about walking. Um, like you're just sort of one of that car. And you're, it's, you've almost sort of like isolated the, the mental process of driving. And uh, this occurs not just with driving, but all sorts of other things. So you know, if you play a lot of music, a particular instrument, you'll notice that if you're, when you become very good, the instrument itself fades away. And you're just making music. Or an um, example that maybe more people are familiar with, playing a video game. Um, and you don't think about the controller after a while. You start to think about the narrative of the game and sort of the world that you're in. And you're not thinking about the position of the buttons. The controller just kind of becomes an extension of your hand. So we really wanted to make sure that users could achieve flow in Firefox, aside from when we're interrupting them with questions. So a big part of this uh, had to do with the visual design. So, and this was, frankly, kind of hard, because we, we didn't want anything that really stood out. We wanted something just kind of meshed with everything else. So as Firefox sort of became part of your workflow throughout the day, it didn't draw a tremendous amount of attention to itself. It, it sort of just was the way all of your windows were. And of course, when you stare at it and you think at it, you think of it, you say, well, wow, that silver is just so ugly. Um, but people don't really stare at their windows throughout the day and analyze how they look. Um, they just sort of use their computer. So we wanted the interface to just sort of fade into nothingness, for it to become an extension of yourself. But we had these two objectives that were pretty much opposites of each other. One was just mesh, just be exactly like the native OS, whatever that is, so that it feels natural and users don't think about it. Like, we didn't want to focus too heavily on our brand. I mean, like Safari on Windows initially, or iTunes on Windows. It's an Apple product, and it's sort of shouting Apple product at you the entire time that you're using it. It looks completely different. Or, I mean, Chrome meshes in terms of colors with the platform pretty well. But it is you know, Googly. It's, it's got this sort of Googleness sort of baked into it and for brand purposes and for you know, people knowing uniquely what it is. So we didn't want to draw too much attention to the product. We wanted it to feel native. But we also wanted it to be uniquely Firefox. And these are opposed to each other. So what we ended up doing is we looked at all the visual variables, and we basically just chopped them in half. Or we said, OK, the color and the value and the texture, basically the material that something's made out of, that gets assigned over to the surrounding operating system. And then everything else is uniquely Firefox. So the challenge here was to basically create an iconic form, create some kind of shape that when people saw that, they just thought, OK, that's, that's what Firefox is. So you know, sort of examples of this, like everyone knows that's VW Bug, and people who play Xbox 360. You know, obviously a Mickey Mouse hat, where it's just, it's just a set of shapes. Like it's, you know, it's just line art, but you see it and you know what it is. So, and the shapes don't really even, they don't have to be ears. Um, it could just be random. Uh, it just, you have to be exposed to it over and over again. So what we did is with the navigation controls, we created this outline. And you know, it was otherwise meaningless. It, it played into the fact that people use the back button a lot. It's like sort of the, the one button that needs to be big in the browser. Um, so it had that usability aspect to it. But we also just wanted to create this sort of unique shape that when you looked at it, you could recognize it as Firefox. And then what we did is we could then render that using all the sort of materials of different platforms. So, you know, OS X, Windows Vista, Windows XP. So it still sort of was native while still having that unique shape to it. And we made a couple tweaks in terms of uh, sort of the arcs we were using so it felt more native, uh, sort of building those in. And the result was we had something that visually sort of meshed, but at the same time was uniquely Firefox. So everything lines up, but it also feels like an OS X application, or it feels like a Windows XP application. 
And the goal is, you know, like basically the on television test, where if you know someone's using Firefox and you sort of glance at it, you know, does it just sort of seem familiar? If you've been using Firefox, you recognize it while not sort of standing out. Or you know, the over the shoulder test, um, where someone has Firefox up on their computer and it clearly is an OS X application, but it's just different enough that it's not Safari. So another important thing that we were focused on was visual hierarchy. Probably the, the best example that I can think of of visual hierarchy in an interface is the TiVo remote. Uh, it does an absolutely fantastic job. I mean, what's the most important control on this remote? Pause, yes. Um, what is the most important control on this remote? <laughs> well, play. What, what's the second most important control on this remote? And then it becomes really hard. Um, so there's really sort of two aspects of this. The first is physical. Uh, how quickly can you find the target that you're looking for? Um, you know, on a physical remote, you're literally touching the target. You know, in an interface, you have to look at it and move the mouse to it, so it's still physical. Um, in fact, that you're doing the visual acquisition and the mouse movement. Um, and then the second is cognitive, so you're not even looking at the interface. You know, can you, in your head, picture where that control is? So like, everyone knows where the pause button is on a TV remote. You, know, you can even sort of picture the curvature of the bottom of it and how the pause button fits into it. Um, and also, you know, mentally, but then just physically, even if you're just really squinting, uh, you know, this is you know, very accurately named the squint test, um, you, you can see that control. Uh, it's clearly most obvious. And that also comes into play for sort of the, the very initial sort of visual processing that we do, uh, where that's sort of the level of information we're bringing in. Even during that phase, you can find that control. So for Firefox, you know, the, the back button is passing that squint test. Uh, and you also sort of have this good mental model of where the back button is because of its shape. So the second aspect of this is cognitive, where, you know, if you're trying to think of a control, like the slow button, like can you remember where the slow button is on a TiVo remote? Can you? I think everyone probably can. All right, blank stairs. Well, the slow button is uh, directly south of the pause button, um, which is very easy to remember because it's in relationship to something that is larger in the hierarchy. Or in the case of you know, the, the PS2 remote, it's, I think it's up two and one to the right or something. It, it just becomes this sort of impossible to remember grid. So basically focusing on landmarks. And I mean, this is how we build mental models of everything, is seeing these sort of unique shapes and sort of remembering things relative to each other. So I mean, here's Europe, and Europe's really easy. Um, <laughs> you know, it's very easy to memorize these countries. So I'm going to highlight one of the countries, and I want everyone to shout out what, which country it is all at the same time, or as fast as you can think of it. It'll probably be all at the same time. All right, ready? Italy. All right, let's play again. Ready? <laughs> All right, come on. All right, thank you. All right, and just to prove this isn't you know a country versus states thing, ready? All right. So the forward button is basically Florida's. It's like Florida to the back button. Uh, even when we clear out what the glyphs are, uh, you can sort of over time memorize what these controls are because of their sort of unique shape and their notion relative to each other, versus just a uniform set. So another thing we focused on very heavily with the design of Firefox was the efficiency of use. Trying to figure out exactly how many interactions were involved for a particular task and if there's any way for us to narrow that down, um, just sort of you know, take every little aspect of time and, and figure out if there's some more efficient way of doing things. And one of the ways this really got baked into the product was the changes to the location bar. Where this is a very early mock-up of the changes we were making where uh, we're working on an algorithm which we ended up calling frequency, it's sort of a mixture of frequency and recency, where we're looking at what you type in and then what results you select and then having that pair over time. And I mean, we, we basically stole this. We, it wasn't our idea. Uh, Quicksilver on OS X, um, I'm sure maybe they took it for someone else, but it's a fantastic idea. Because over time, it sort of adapts and learns. Uh, you know, it learns that you type letter F, you want Firefox. So we basically applied that algorithm to the location bar. Um, and it was able to very efficiently just clear out most of the other keystrokes. And the browser just sort of became your browser and sort of meshed with your behavior. So another thing we worked on was selective visual variables. Um, sort of the best way to show this as an example, this also ties into the location bar. So in this array, uh, how many Ks are there? Just shout the number when you, when you count all of them. OK. So it took a while, and it wasn't super accurate. Um, <laughs> so. Um, so that was shape, um, but some visual variables are selective um, uh, where you can find them immediately. So how many red letters are there? All right, really fast. So basically, some variables are selective and some aren't, uh, meaning that you know, constant time to access versus doing a linear search. 
So the nice thing about color being selective is you can build that into your information displays. And it's not just Firefox and the location bar. We also see this in Google search results. Or if you know you're looking for a URL, you can just sort of mentally filter on green and then just start scanning all the URLs. Or you can mentally filter on blue if you're looking for a title and just start scanning down. So even though we've taken those two pieces of information and sort of meshed them into one list, um, you can still just sort of select on the one that you want to filter on. So that was all stuff in Firefox 3. Sort of quickly going into Firefox 4, uh, one of the first things we focused a lot on was the conceptual model of the application. Um, and this, over time, had kind of become a mess. So if you look at you know, Firefox 3.5, uh, green controls act on the tab, and purple controls act on the browser itself. And then when you're really used to a browser, it seems obvious. But if you just you know, sat down for the very first time and looked at a browser, it's not clear that back and forward are going to control the tab that has the focus. If anything, it might control which tab was selected. So if I select tab A, then I select tab B, and I hit back, I might expect tab A to be selected again. So, and this is kind of a... An artifact over time of the fact that tabs were added at the same time they were trying to pull market share off of IE without sort of changing position too much. And of course, you know, we started stripping out a lot of controls, but then uh, you know, it's still a mess uh, in terms of the conceptual model. So you know, putting tabs on top uh, really sort of streamlines that, where you know the back and forward are going to act on the correct thing. And then it's not just conceptual model. You obviously have the Fitz Law wins of getting something up against the screen edge. Um, but the thing was, like, we already knew about this stuff. We knew about this stuff for years, and Firefox still didn't have that the interface. So what sort of triggered that? And basically, uh, it was a series of mock-ups that we had exploring what the web could be in terms of applications that was able to convince people to go over to putting tabs on top. With you know, 3HTML5 exposing native toolbars and native menu bars to have these sort of rich applications. In this case, we're able to strip away the browser controls because it's something the user's installed. Uh, in this case, it's actually running as an open app tab. And sort of you know, have this native feel that brings web applications to the full sort of desktop experience. So here's a map example. Uh, here's a spreadsheet example, sort of basing off Google Spreadsheets, where you have the full sort of accessibility, and you don't have the sort of you know, box inside a box inside a box aspect of the web, where you know, it'd be silly if you opened up Microsoft Excel, and it had like a location bar showing you like, the location of the EXE on your hard drive. Like, you don't really need a location bar for applications. So by putting tabs on top, we were able to create this conceptual model where the application could really own the entire space. So another thing we worked on was, uh, you know, again, consistency is one of the things we're very big on, was sort of interactive integration with the standing operating system. And particularly on Windows, there's a sort of notion of this very sort of high contrast button in the upper left that's going to have, you know, core controls like printing or going full screen, things like that. So it really just made sense in this model where users are interacting with these applications throughout the day to have that same notion for Firefox, where we have, this is, of course, for users on Vista or, or Windows 7. We still have a traditional interface for users on Windows XP. Uh, with the menu bar. But it just re really sort of made sense to have, you know, if you need to print this document, you're thinking, you know, something that starts with an F that's colorful in the upper left. And it also works really well because it serves as sort of a title and a control at the same time, so you're able to collapse two things into one thing uh, to sort of streamline the interface. And, of course, it helps with brand recognition, having users, you know, sort of constantly interact with the brand of your product. So another thing we worked on was spatial memory. So basically, I mean, you can sort of picture your kitchen in your head, and you know where your forks are. Uh, they have very high frequency, in fact, your forks. Uh, and, and in addition to having high frequency, you put the forks in that drawer. So we were focused on, with this in terms of tab management, where this is a new feature called Panorama, where you can go into this mode and start organizing your tabs into various groups of things that you work on. Because Firefox users have, you know, like literally hundreds of tabs in some cases. It can then sort of, you know, filter down to just focusing on that one specific group. And because you, you place them into that position, you build up that strong memory of where they are. So another thing we sort of focused on more of Firefox 4 than previously was usage metrics. Well, we're basically you know, counting clicks. Um, you know, this is pretty common. A lot of people do this. Um, and it was really useful in terms of understanding what was, what was critical and what wasn't in terms of the browser. I mean, a lot of our sort of initial um, you know, thoughts that we had were you know, proven true. I was still kind of shocked that you know, a lot of users will click the, uh, the up arrow on the, on the scroll bar, uh, which is kind of disturbing, uh, just sort of clicking it over and over again to scroll. Um, also, you know, looking at the menu bar was very interesting. Uh, which commands are being heavily used and which aren't. And what was important about getting this data was it allowed us, allowed us to really sort of recraft, when we were reorganizing and recrafting the menu, we could really streamline operations. So here's um, one of the early versions of the Firefox button, so the contents of when you click on that. And we're able to look at, you know, putting high value controls, you know, more discoverable and closer to the top. But the sort of curious thing about this is when you make something more discoverable, people are going to use it more. 
So then like, the metrics are going to follow with what you do. So you can't just optimize to the metrics because it's going to play out that like, you know, if you put private browsing as the very first item, more people are going to use private browsing. Um, so the, the trick with this is basically to, to design it the way that you, you want and to focus on the features that you want to promote and what you think makes sense. And then sort of use the data to validate that, uh, to see if you made any obvious mistakes. Because if you're just sort of chasing the usage metrics data itself, then it's not clear who's designing. Is it you know, just random, where the users are following the thing you created? Um, or is it you know, sort of just emerging out of this process? So it's important to sort of design and then verify with the data, and not have the data doing the design. So sort of you know, going back to this model of you know, sort of strong designer versus user-centric, you know, the sort of answer we have is you know, design, then verify, where it sort of flows in this direction. So it's not that we're anti-testing. It's just we're using testing as this evaluation stage. So that's pretty much the whole talk. We have about five minutes left for, or no, we have 20 minutes left for questions. So my question for you is, uh, I work at a, basically a security company, and how do you guys kind of deal with the making security as usable, you know, or make it usable as secure allows kind of all the different things that are involved in actually right. keeping something secure while still making it usable? Um, this, this is a very good question, and something that's actually kind of debated. So it's, it's my personal view that um, security isn't something that really the user needs to be, should be in control of. It, it should be secure by itself, just as your car shouldn't explode you know, based off how you drive it. The, the car should just simply not explode. Um, in fact, I think every time we talk about security, we undermine the user's confidence in the product. Um, so, and that's hard, because like, pretty much everyone on the security team wants to talk about security all the time. right? <laughs> Um, and I think as we do that, people are starting to get freaked out that they think Firefox is insecure. So I mean, one aspect of this is we're very public with how many security vulnerabilities we have. I mean, we have to be because everything's open and public. Whereas uh, you know, Microsoft in particular doesn't make those announcements based off of their security vulnerabilities. So if you're just sort of looking at the news, it's pretty clear that Microsoft has a more secure product. But what they have is a quieter product. Um, so there's that aspect of it. Another is um, sort of making sure that we, we understand where the user's confused. So, like the location bar is, I mean, unfortunately, Tim Berners-Lee made some big mistakes. Like it's you know, subdomain, then domain, and then path. So the most important critical piece of information is in the middle. And most people don't understand that sort of structure where it gets higher and then lower. Um, it, you know, it's too bad it's not like you know, com.mozilla slash path, right? Like that would have been much nicer. Um, so we need to make sure that you know, we've redesigned that so that it's very clear. Um, you know, which piece of information is the most critical. I mean, uh, we see this a lot with you know, using you know, gray versus black, things like that, where we have some mock-ups that involve you know, some even more obvious aspects that people can parse that information correctly. So, does that cover it? Hi. Yeah. Hey, Jimmy. Uh, great talk. Uh, I was just curious, uh, you kind of alluded to this um, App Store model that you, mm -hmm. that you showed earlier, and that, that certainly a model that's been picking up steam, especially in the mobile world, and now, you know, Google's trying to put it into the desktop model. And it's something that people have gotten used to on mobile phones and so on. How do you see that kind of mental model merging with, you know, the open web model that we're used to on the desktop? So there's some things that are very good about the App Store. I mean, it is recognition over recall, right? You know, you're looking at these objects that you've, you know, maybe even spatial memory, you've placed these apps where you put them you know, on your home screen. You acquired them. Uh, they all have colorful icons. So you can recognize them. Whereas the location bar, you know, it's, it's text entry. It's the command line. It's recall. So that aspect's really good. Um, and it's really important. The, the only thing that sort of concerns me is when you have app stores that are you know, locked into a particular product, so I mean, a lot of people can't move over to Android because they've spent a lot of money you know, on their iPhone applications. And obviously, it makes a lot of sense for Apple to use that model to try to you know, lock people into their phone. But the whole point of the web is the fact that you can move between devices, you can move between operating systems. So the extent to which people are using open standards to create lockdown applications is really worrisome. Uh, it needs to be the case that when you open up, you know, switching over to Firefox as your browser, any application you've acquired from another store is going to be immediately available and paid for and accessible in Firefox. Yeah. So a quick question about the, the Chrome Store. Um, if you make a HTML app for the Chrome Store, um, it will run on any browser that supports, supports those HTML5 calls, CSS3 or JavaScript. So they're not really locking you into... Chrome, they're locking you into a browser that has those features. So could you talk a little bit about the collaboration between you 
and Chrome and trying to bring the whole ecosystem together in HTML5, CSS3, the latest JavaScript, and just, you know, they're right. open, you're open, you guys should work together. Right. <laughs> and no, I think that is the case. I think the, the extent to which uh, things have been said to be exclusive, I think, is mostly sort of branding and marketing. I mean, it's, you now arrive at websites where they say, look, you know, this piece of the New York Times is for Chrome, or you know, TweetDeck, this, this part of TweetDeck is for Chrome. And then there's a little hyperlink that says, or you could just use it. Um, you know? <laughs> and this is kind of bad, because the user's mental model, especially if they don't want to switch to Firefox because they like YouTube, the user's mental model is going to be one of lock-in. So it's, even if it's all open in terms of technical specs, if the, the aspect of you know, logos and terminology implies lock-in, the users are going to think they're locked in. And, and you know, we're all designers, so we know the mental model is the king, right? It's the user's perception that's actually going to dictate behavior. Hi. Go ahead. So um, it, you were sort of uh, piggybacking off the last two, but then also referencing your, your presentation you, where you were talking about how trying to mesh with the the operating environment, right? Mm -hmm. Windows XP, Vista, or whatever. So it, it seems like as more of these apps are coming in, you're becoming the system. Right? So like Chrome OS is sort of right. doing the same thing. So how do you guys as designers start to think about your product as becoming Right, this space that people are playing in, and, and not right. necessarily something that just has to mesh with the the OS. Um, yeah, no. I, so uh, Chrome OS is an example of sort of you know it is it, the the thing that shows the user the clock is the operating system, right? Um, not the device drivers. Um, so Firefox hasn't adopted that model um, of having sort of a, you know entire you know operating environment. We're more sort of embrace and extend where regardless of what platform you're on, if it's you know XP or Vista or Seven or Linux or OS Ten. Firefox becomes sort of a critical part of that operating environment. And you know, Microsoft even released some statistics that they're saying like 57% of the time that users are sitting in front of a, one of the, you know, a Windows computer, they're using the web. So it's really, um, it's, it's still sort of the case that even though Firefox doesn't contain the clock, it is their, their operating environment. So one of the things we're doing a lot of thinking around, especially for Firefox 5, I can call up some mock-ups on this, um, is this notion of like when sites are running in sort of a browser, site-specific browser mode or an application mode, actually exposing things outside of the, the normal browser frame to them. So, um, and IE, IE9's done a little bit with uh, context menus on applications, but actually, you know, allowing Facebook, when it's running as a Facebook application, to have a Facebook button and populate that with commands. Or also with the tabs on top decision, you know, having native toolbars and native menus accessible to HTML5. So it's now the case that you write a web application, and it's not just you're writing for this frame inside of this window, but you're writing this full feature-rich application that can take advantage of all the sort of aspects that the operating system involves. You know, be it right-click menu on the dock on OS X, um, or just having a big icon on the dock on OS X. So I think Firefox is going to, you know, in some ways, kind of relegate itself to middleware and the fact that people don't care about codecs or rendering engines, but relegate itself to this important aspect of your operating system that enables your applications to kind of spread throughout the operating environment. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Yeah. Um, in your slides, you spent a fair amount of time on the slides with the green and red arrows. Mm -hmm. There seemed to be an assumption there that it was terribly important to make sure that users would see all the buttons in places where they would expect. In the experiences I've had of helping people uh, transition between browsers and use computers in general, I find that typically they only use one or two of the uh, gadgets in the user interface and are totally confused. So right. trying to preserve location turned out not to be terribly important. Um, yeah, no, I think it's definitely the case that someone can very quickly wrap their head around a new configuration of controls. The problem is they're making the decision on if they want to switch to a new browser in such a tremendously short amount of time. Um, they can very quickly sort of look at Firefox and say, eh, no, I don't know how to use this, close it, and then never come back. So under that model, it's really important to sort of you know, acquire the user quickly. Um, also, the, the controls that I was focusing on, even though there was a lot of arrows, it was you know, the command structure, you know, the menu uh, commands like file and you know, print and things like that, and also like back, forward, reload, stop, I mean, stuff that everyone's going to be using in a browser. So it wasn't, you know, did they move the RSS button? Like, we could definitely move the RSS button. We could remove the RSS button, and it wouldn't impact anything. So, um, so that's true. The other, the other thing that I think uh, we were consistent at the same time that we were bringing in lots and lots of market share from IE. So I think there might have been a correlation in thought where people overvalued consistency later because it was so successful for us. Um, and, I mean, I think it's also been successful for Chrome to some extent with you know, having the page and tools button uh, for bringing IE users in. But I don't think we've correctly validated that it is necessarily as important as we believe it is. 
Thank you.